Welcome and happy Easter to you. He is risen. You know, I've never been through a time when Easter happened and we weren't gathering uh, together as a, as a church. Um, and, and, it, and so it's bittersweet to be bringing this video to you today. But, you know, I'm also very, very excited because the Easter message is so wonderful. It is so great to focus on the resurrection of our Lord and Savior that any way I get to bring it to you is good. And uh, so before we do that, I want to go ahead and get through a few of these announcements here real quick. Uh, just a reminder, it's still possible to contribute uh, financially to the church even while we're closed. Um, your gifts can be mailed in right to the church address, 730 West Roosevelt Avenue here in Nampa. Um, or, uh, if you need to, we also have an online giving option available at our website at nampalutheranbrethren.org. Women's Ministries is going to be getting together again for a uh, online meeting, a virtual meeting. That's going to happen on Thursday of this week at 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, all ladies are invited to participate. It's a great opportunity to get to see one another, uh, do a little devotion, some sharing, all that kind of thing. So I hope you can make it. If you uh, need the login information for that, please contact Debbie Gazzola at gazzolagirl at hotmail.com. Just another reminder for you, too, to save the date. The Women's Retreat that we hold every year is happening October 9th through the 11th this year. And uh, as you may have guessed, there will be no women's coffee gathering for April due to the virus going on. Uh, also, just remember that if you are in need of assistance in any way from our serving sisters, uh, Alice Davis is your contact for that. You can call her or email her at uh, either of those, uh, the, uh, rather both of those pieces of information are on your screen there. And just remember again that we are still here for you. Uh, you can reach out uh, to me through the church phone 208-466-0065 that rings both here at the church and at the house or you can email me at my uh, personal email or through the link on the website um, you know, are your elders and the rest of your congregation are here for you too and uh, so don't be afraid if you are in need reach out we're all here to help one another and so with that, we'll get on to our readings for this Easter Sunday, followed by this special Easter message. Blessings to you. Over my shoulder today is a beautiful depiction of the power of Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, you probably can't see it too well through the uh, through the camera, but it is. It shows Christ on the cross while at the same time showing him emerging from the empty tomb, conquering death and the devil. It's from a, a piece called the Weimar Altarpiece by Lucas Cranach the Younger, done in 1555. And if you haven't seen this before, do yourself a favor and look it up online. It's absolutely beautiful, and the imagery in it is, is so powerful. And so it's that conquering of sin and death and Satan uh, that Jesus accomplished in his resurrection that is going to be the focus of our texts for today. And so to start with, we're looking at Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, through chapter 15, verse 1, which is the account of the Israelites' miraculous delivery uh, from the hands of the Egyptian army. And so we'll, uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, through 15, 1. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses, his, his chariots, and his horsemen went in after them to the midst of the sea. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, Let us free from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over the chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord, and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. This miraculous work of the Lord drowning the Egyptians after creating dry land for the Israelites to cross is more than just a historical account of God's incredible power. It is an image of what Christ has done in his resurrection from the grave. In the Egyptians we see a reflection of sin and death from which the which from the beginning enslaves us holds us captive and causes us to die apart from the holy land of God's kingdom. But on the cross, Jesus conquered sin, and in his resurrection, he conquered death. And by him, God has delivered us safely into his kingdom while drowning those ancient enemies behind us. The horse and its rider have been drowned in the sea. Next up is Psalm 118 verses 15 through 29. Uh, another beautiful depiction of the, the work Christ has done in his death and resurrection. Psalm 118 verses 15 through 29. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die, but live, and tell of the works of the Lord. 
The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who came, comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who is righteous enough to enter through the gates of the Lord? Who is righteous enough to enter through the gates of righteousness? Only the one for whom the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The Lord has done valiantly in conquering death through the resurrection of Christ, throwing open the gates of righteousness for all of us poor sinners to walk through. And if you simply believe, you will not die, but live. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. From the epistles, we go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. And this is Paul summarizing the content of what we believe, what it is that saves us. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11 reads this way. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove in vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. How can you be saved? Well, it's by hearing the gospel and believing it to be true. But it can get really easy sometimes as we go through all the writings of Scripture to get bogged down in all the details and the history and the propositions that Scripture makes. So what is the core message of the Gospel? What is it that we must believe in order to be saved? Well, Paul lays it out right here. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised again on that first Easter Sunday. And that he appeared to the disciples. Do you believe this? Because if you do, then God's grace toward you was not in vain, but instead you are saved by that grace. Our Gospel text for this Easter Sunday comes from John. This is John's account of the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday. So I'm going to be reading John chapter 20 verses 1 through 9 which reads this way. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid, them, laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, 
but did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. He is risen! And I, I, I love proclaiming that on Easter Sunday. He is risen. But what does that mean exactly? And by asking what that means, we're asking why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? Does his rising from the dead affect me? And what are we saying to others when we say he is risen? And why it is important to answer these questions is seen in the reaction of the disciples to finding that empty tomb. After Jesus had died, Joseph of Arimathea donated his own family tomb to lay Jesus to rest. And because the Sabbath was going to start very soon after he died, they hurriedly took Jesus' body and laid him in that tomb, doing just as much preparation on the body as they could before they ran out of time and the Sabbath started. This is why we see Mary Magdalene going back to the tomb very early on Sunday morning. And now I say Sunday morning because that's how we would understand the days. Um, but the Jews didn't have names for the days. They just named them according to their relationship to the Sabbath. And so since this was the first day after the Sabbath, they called it the first day of the week. But Mary and, and some of the other women, they're going to the tomb on Sunday morning before the sun is even up, carrying all the materials they need to finish preparing Jesus' body. But as she approaches, something's wrong. That large, impossibly heavy stone that had been covering the tomb was rolled away. Someone had done violence to Jesus' final resting place. And she's thinking, it wasn't enough that they killed her Lord. They have now gone and desecrated his body by taking it out of the tomb. She didn't yet understand that Jesus had risen. And so back to the disciples she goes to tell them what she saw. And Peter and John rush back to the tomb to see for themselves. That's who this other disciple is. It's John. He never refers to himself by name in his own gospel, but calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved or the other disciple. But the news Mary had brought demands immediate attention. Some low-life grave robber has broken in the tomb and stolen Jesus' body, and they've got to figure out where it is. Now here we're going to play a little CSI, a little crime scene investigation. If you're walking into a crime scene like this, where there's suspicion of a grave robber, you know generally what the, the scene's going to look like. It ought to be a mess. And, and with guards at the tomb, you'd expect signs of a struggle or maybe even a couple of dead guards. There'd be evidence that the robbers were in a hurry to get in there and get the body out. But when Peter and John get there, they see something very different. The guards are gone. The wrappings that had been around Jesus' body are lying there undisturbed grave robber would have taken the time to unwrap a body before stealing it. And the handkerchief that was laid over his face was nicely rolled up and lying elsewhere. What grave robber would do that? And it was only after they saw these things that they believed. See, on their way to the tomb, Peter and John didn't yet understand that Jesus has risen. And Jesus has risen. It's, it's foundational to our faith. It's essential to our salvation. It's so important, in fact, that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Which brings us to that first question I, I put out there at the beginning of this sermon. Why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? And to begin answering that, we have to look at what God has said about his Messiah, what he has said about the one who will bring, bring victory over sin, death, and the devil. 
And for that, we need to start with Isaiah 53.10, which says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. See, on the cross, Jesus did offer himself as a guilt offering. A guilt offering for sin. And it might be tempting to say that that's enough. It's, it's certainly wonderful. Certainly more than we could have ever hoped for. But that wasn't the end of the plan that God had set in motion. Rather, after being put to death as a guilt offering, this Savior would see his offspring. He will be alive to see all his children in the community of faith, his days being extended so that he would reign over his children. Because it is the good pleasure of the Lord that we would be saved by faith. And that good pleasure has prospered in Jesus' hand. Now what else has God said about his Messiah? Psalm 10, 72, 17 is, is part of a psalm that declares the eternal reign of a righteous king. And it says, May his name endure forever. May his name increase as long as the sun shines, and let men bless themselves by him. Let all nations call him blessed. By rising from the dead, the righteous king reigns forever, and his name endures forever, increasing as more and more sinners come to saving faith in him. And what's more, by his everlasting life, the promise given to Abraham is fulfilled when God said to him, let all nations call him blessed. Abraham's seed would be the one through whom all nations would be blessed. And Jesus has fulfilled this promise in his resurrection. And to round things off there, it's good to look at Jesus' own words regarding his resurrection. Back in John chapter 2, verse 19, after Jesus cleanses the temple from the, the vendors and the money changers, he says to the authorities, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now those words get used and misused by his enemies, where they claim that he said he himself will destroy the temple, painting him to be some kind of terrorist or blasphemer. But for the disciples, he kept on telling them that he would die and be raised again on the third day. And Jesus is no liar. And, truth be told, through his death and resurrection, he did indeed destroy the temple. Because that temple was the place where sinners must go to make atonement for their sin. With his one perfect atonement finished, the temple was now obsolete. He had destroyed its temporary purpose and rose again as the one who is both the perfect sacrifice and the perfect high priest. He has, pro he has fulfilled his promise to rebuild that temple in three days in himself, and he is now the permanent temple. God revealed who his Messiah would be. Jesus prophesied regarding himself and what he would do. It is important that Jesus rose again in order to be that Messiah and to prove to the world also that he is that Messiah. And so Jesus has fulfilled the prophecies regarding the Messiah by rising again. Now comes the, the with him. You know, what's in it for me? Does his rising from the dead affect me? Well, again, it's good to start with those prophecies that concern the coming Savior. To see what they have to say. And to start with, I'm going to revisit 1 Corinthians chapter 15, looking at the, the greater argument being made concerning the importance of Jesus' resurrection. There it says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we of all men are most to be pitied. So look at the first point Paul makes. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worth, worthless, and you are still in your sins. 
Jesus paying for our sins on the cross was indeed remarkable and wonderful. But without the resurrection, the wages of sin, which is death, have not been paid for. They have not been paid for until he conquers death and rises again. You are still in your sin, and death will still hold you, just as it held Christ if he had not risen again. But because he has risen again, you know, without a doubt, that you are no longer in your sin. That your sin is completely removed from you. And God's judgment upon sin no longer applies to you. And furthermore, just a little later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul goes on to explain that it was by Christ's resurrection that the resurrection of the dead comes to all people. For more on that, we go to Isaiah 25, 8, where it says, He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Sin and death go hand in hand. Where there is sin, there is death. But by removing the reproach of his people from all the earth, by removing sin from all people, Jesus has swallowed up death for all time. For those of us who fall asleep in Christ, those of us who experience the death of the body, we know that we do not die, but rather pass into eternal life where Christ is. You now have the assurance that though the body dies, you will not die, because Christ has swallowed up death in victory. Swallowing up death and victory, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 54, by the way. And, and by now, you're probably getting the impression that if you want a really good treatise on the resurrection of Christ, dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But going on, the next thing I want to say before moving on from this question comes from Hebrews 2, 14. Check this out. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Does that roaring, prowling lion, the devil, frighten you? He should. He's the one who brought sin into the world. He's the one who had the power of death. He's the one who loves nothing more than to keep people from from proclaiming the Lordship of Christ. But he's the one whose power over death has been rendered impotent by the resurrection of Christ. Satan, with his power of death, could not hold Christ. And you who are in Christ cannot be held by death either. Satan has been rendered powerless to you. And now all of his pitiful attempts to attack you and those you love. They're nothing more than the, the whiny fit of a fussy toddler who didn't get his way. So yeah, Jesus' rising from the death affects you. It affects you greatly and wonderfully, conquering sin, death, and the devil in one short weekend. You get to say he is risen knowing full well what that means for you, as well as for others. Which brings us to our last question. When, when, what are we saying to others when we say, He is risen? Around this time of year, a bunch of memes start popping up on the internet talking about zombie Jesus. Right? Maybe you've seen them. Some of them are actually kind of funny, but they're not serious. You know, nobody around you... I don't think, actually believes that when we say he is risen, that we're talking about an, an undead zombie Jesus. But the idea of a risen Jesus is as foreign to many of the people around you as it was to Mary, the rest of the women, and, and the disciples here on that first Easter Sunday. And so I think it's good to end by talking about what we are really saying to others who don't yet understand what it means that Jesus has risen. And so for the first thing I think that needs to be addressed is the fact that death itself is terrifying to people in general. 
And certainly an amount of that fear is what my own death would do to people around me, how it will affect my spouse, my family, my friends. But that fear also consists of knowing that death is the end. It's final. I can't accomplish anything else once I'm dead. I can't love anyone anymore once I'm dead. I can't enjoy the things I enjoy now once I'm dead. And so the world clings so desperately to life because life is all it has. And as we proclaim he is risen to the world, we are sending the message that death doesn't actually have the final word. That through faith in Christ's death and resurrection, death is an entrance into life. Real life. Life as it was intended to be. Joyful. Blissful. A life where there are no more tears, no more struggle or pain. A life where death isn't even in our vocabulary. And also, when we announce to the world he is risen, we are telling the world that there is someone who is infinitely more powerful than anyone or anything that they know of now. So often our daily fears and anxieties come from the things that are beyond our control. And our hope is placed in people and institutions who are supposed to be looking out for our best interests. But who are also human and fallible, just like we are. Wouldn't it be great to know that there is someone who possesses perfect knowledge, who exhibits perfect care for those he loves, and who acts perfectly selflessly as he cares for them? Wouldn't it be great to know that even if this world falls apart around us, that there is a place to go where we'll never have to worry again? In his resurrection, Jesus Christ becomes an eternal king and high priest for those who call on his name. And knowing who's really in charge goes a long way in calming those anxieties we have concerning those who appear to be in charge. And finally, as we announce to the world he is risen, we are announcing that there is relief from all the guilt and pain we have for the wrong that we do. You know, try as the world might, it cannot get past the fact that God has imprinted the idea of right and wrong on the hearts of everyone. And yes, that impression gets twisted and mangled by the world's ways and by our own reason. But we still can't escape the fact that when we do wrong, we hurt. Wouldn't it be great to know that there is a good reason behind that shame and guilt? Wouldn't it be good to know that there is a why behind feeling guilt and shame? And wouldn't it be fantastic to know that the author of Right and Wrong has done everything necessary to remove the guilt and shame from you? When we say he is risen, that's exactly what we're saying to others. We're acknowledging the very real pain of sin, the reason why that pain exists, and the remedy for it, which is our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. He is risen. That is what the disciples discovered on that first Easter morning. That is what we celebrate today, and that is what we get to announce to the world. Praise be to God and our Lord for conquering sin, death, and the devil through his resurrection. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for conquering sin, death, and the devil on that first Easter weekend. Lord, we thank you for giving us the faith to believe that is true and saving us through it. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to pray together, and we want to pray for Tina's uncle Bill and his ongoing health troubles. We pray that you would give him healing and rest and the care that he needs during this time. Lord, we think of Larry Stoltenberg 
and we thank you that he's now done with his treatments and for this wonderful news that they cannot seem to find any cancer in him anymore. Lord, you are good. And we pray your continued hand on him as he heals and recovers. Lord, we pray for Larry Seibold and his many health troubles. Pray too that you give him comfort, give him healing, and get him the care he needs. Lord, we pray for all of our health care providers, our doctors, nurses, therapists, all who are still working during this health crisis. We thank you for their, their service and pray that you would protect them and keep them safe from, from this virus going around. Lord, we do pray for those who right now are, are alone, who are scared, who are affected by this, this virus crisis in, in ways that maybe we ourselves are not. We pray that you give comfort there and give us opportunities to serve our neighbor in whatever capacity we can. And Lord, most of all, we uh, do pray that your name would be glorified during this time. Not just in the things we do, but because of who you are. And it's in